Hi, it's Midnight Mule and today I want to look at whether or not it's fair to call Watchtower a false prophet. Many people will say that they are a false prophet. Watchtower will say that they're not a false prophet. So, which is it? When I first thought about doing this video, I thought it's not going to take very long. There's some obvious verses in Deuteronomy to look at, a couple of things from Watchtower and we get to the answer. But when I started putting all this together, I was just getting more and more material and then I'd find Watchtower saying something. So I then got to see, is there something else to balance that out? Can we say anything about that? So I think this might end up being quite a long video and that's why it's been a couple of weeks since I did my last one. because It's just taken so long to put it together and then take photos. So I have, as I said in a previous video, I've bought a lot of Watchtower books. You can see some behind me. The reason for this is Jehovah's Witnesses who follow the Watchtower believe what the Watchtower say. The Watchtower say that apostates lie. Things you see on the internet that are against us are written by apostates. They've been changed digitally. You can't trust them. But a Jehovah's Witness will look at the original, which is why I've spent a lot of money on the originals. So when I meet a Jehovah's Witness in real life, we can honestly look at them. So uh, some of the things I'll be looking at today there's obviously the Bible, the New World Translation, their version. All quotes are going to be from their version of the Bible. There's a load of bound volumes I'll be doing. Here they are. The bound volumes I've got I'll be using. There are a few that I haven't got, so I'll be using their website for that. So in case you want to check these yourself, this is the Watchtower from 1965. Watchtower 1972. This is the order they'll be coming up. Awake 1967, Watchtower 1985, Watchtower 1956, Watchtower 1973, and the Awake 1969. Now if you're wondering why I'm off centre a bit, and there's a big space over here, that's because for some of this I'm going to have some text on the screen while I'm still visible, but when the text is a bit smaller I'll make it take up the whole screen. So if we start by looking at what are the questions I want to be asking. That's the wrong way. That's the right way. What I want to look at is, do the Watchtower claim to be a prophet? Because if they don't even claim to be a prophet, can we call them a false prophet? I think somebody could not even use the word and say, the Lord says this is going to happen. It's like, yeah, they're a prophet, even if they're a false prophet. But do they claim to be a prophet? Are the Watchtower directed by God? Are Jehovah's Witnesses in the truth? So do they claim to be a prophet? If the Watchtower are directed by God, then it's absolutely right that Jehovah's Witnesses should stay away from all the apostate material on the internet. So it does make sense. But like I said, I've got the originals here, so hopefully we can have a good look at what's going on. Obviously, I've got to give this notice now. I will be using material that has been copyrighted pretty much is nearly all by the Watchtower but it's for fair purposes blah 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 so you start off reasoning from the scriptures so here's a good book reasoning from the scriptures the point of this book from what I can see is it helps the witnesses as they go door to door they may get asked tricky questions and oh frames being dropped okay they're asked tricky questions and here it gives them example answers. So the person might say this, you might want to say that. And these are all the most common questions that come up. So looking at reasoning from the scriptures, which was, it was written in 1985. I've got the 1989 edition. So one question they may get asked at the door is, have not Jehovah's Witnesses made errors in their teachings? Now something the Watchtower do, this is just me now because I'm Aspie perhaps, is they'll ask a lot of negative questions. So for me, I'd have preferred it to say, have Jehovah's Witnesses made errors in their teachings? But the question is, have not Jehovah's Witnesses made errors in their teachings? So I've always got to work my brain a bit differently there because I find negative questions difficult. Anyway, what they write on page 136, have not Jehovah's Witnesses made errors in their teachings? Jehovah's Witnesses do not claim to be inspired prophets. They have made mistakes, 
Like the apostles of Jesus Christ, they have at times had some wrong expectations. Jehovah's Witnesses do not claim to be inspired prophets. My question is based on, are the Watchtower, do the Watchtower claim to be a prophet? Now, some of what we look at, we'll look at Jehovah's Witnesses as well, but I'm interested in the organisation. Then they say, Jehovah's Witnesses do not claim to be inspired prophets. I will agree with that verbatim as it's written. The Bible doesn't use the phrase inspired prophets. Their literature doesn't really... No, they do use inspired prophets in their literature. The Bible doesn't say inspired prophets. It might as well say, uh, did Jehovah's Witnesses claim to be pyjama wearing prophets? Or do Jehovah's Witnesses claim to be prophets painted blue? It's like the Bible doesn't say about pyjama wearing prophets or blue prophets. The Bible doesn't say about inspired prophets. The Bible says prophets. And the quotes that they use from the Bible says prophets. So we straight away this is like going down the straw man route for arguments no one's accusing them of being inspired prophets or accusing them of claiming to be inspired prophets it's all about if they're prophets ran over <laughs> right they they'll then say hit the cheek they've got here look they have made mistakes they're saying they've made mistakes yes we know they've made mistakes throughout the literature you'll see today they often admit yeah yeah we got things wrong but they're saying, oh, the apostles of Jesus Christ, they at times had wrong expectations. And they quote Luke 1911 and Acts 1 6. So let's have a look at this. This is from their website. Luke 1911. While they were listening to these things, he told another illustration because he was near Jerusalem and they thought that the kingdom of God was going to appear instantly. So the disciples thought the kingdom of God was going to appear instantly. The disciples were not going around saying, the kingdom of God's about to appear. Don't bother learning anything. Don't do your education. Don't get married. It's about to happen. They thought something was going to happen. They were not teaching any doctrines or any commands or making any suggestions based on what they thought. The Bible simply records they thought a certain thing. The next one, Acts 1, 6. So when they had assembled, they asked him, Lord, are you restoring the kingdom to Israel at this time? Again, there's nothing in the scriptures to suggest on the back of this. They started doing this, that and the other and giving people bad advice. Nowhere. So for Watchtower to then go on and say, oh, look, the apostles got things wrong. They had bad expectations. No wonder we have got things wrong. That is absolutely not a false. That is not a fair comparison. And that should just be ignored. Truth that leads to eternal life. Any Jehovah's Witness that has been around for quite a while will be familiar with this book and this is a very important resource book for it was at the time it's probably discontinued now but it used to be key and that's from 1968 so i'm going to zoom out a bit so we can see this better hopefully here we go we need to examine not only what we personally believe but also what is taught by any religious organization with which we may be associated are its teachings in full harmony with God's word, or are they based on the traditions of men? If we are lovers of the truth, there is nothing to fear from such an examination. It should be the sincere desire of every one of us to learn what God's will is for us, and then to do it. So, Jehovah's Witnesses are instructed here that you need to examine, not Jehovah's Witnesses only, but who they go to door to door, but you need to examine what we personally believe and also what is taught by any religious organisation. So it's absolutely right. If you're Jehovah's Witness, you should examine what the Watchtower have taught because they tell you to do that. So that's certainly good. And it says there should be nothing to fear from doing that. So isn't that good? We can do this with a clear conscience. Reasoning from the Scriptures, the same book. It has a section, has a definition for false prophets. The definition they use Individuals and organisations proclaiming messages that they attribute to a superhuman source, but that do not originate with the true God and are not in harmony with his revealed will. So, if it turns out that the Watchtower have been proclaiming messages that have been attributed to a superhuman source, for example God, but they don't really originate from God, then by their own definition they would be a false prophet. Insight of the Scriptures. This is volume two. Obviously I have both volumes. The reason I got this originally was 
the local Kingdom Hall where I went for several months. An elder there, when I was talking about something, said, I'll oh, just get insight in the scriptures. I'm looking there for your answers. I'm aware it's available online, but who knows how long these things will be online for. So I've got the originals. So insight in the scriptures. This is from 1988, volume two, like I said. All right. What's this one saying? The three essentials for establishing the credentials of a true prophet as given through Moses were the true prophet would speak in Jehovah's name. The things foretold would come to pass. And then it mentions Deuteronomy 18, 20, 22, which is rarely cited by the Watchtower. And there's a good reason for that. If you read it, you'll realize why they don't refer to it. And they go on to say his prophesying must promote true worship, being in harmony with God's revealed word and commandments. And that's Deuteronomy 13, 1 to 4. So this whole video is going to be based around those two. Uh, sorry if I'm stuttering. I suddenly see frames getting dropped again, but it's the vocal that's important. Uh, this video is going to be based on those two passages there. Oh, what's our bound volume? OK, what does this say? Oh, I want to go back to here. This isn't quite true. It says the three essentials for establishing the credentials of a true prophet as given through Moses were blah and blah. Actually, these two passages are talking about how to identify a false prophet. They're not saying how to identify a true. But I guess you could reasonably say if these things for the false prophet aren't true, then you could assume these things mean it's a true prophet. But these are actually talking about false prophets. Right. This is from the Bound Volume 1965. The best method of proof is to put a prophecy to the test of time and circumstances. The Bible invites such a test. And then it gives two verses, 1 John 4, 1 and Isaiah 45, 11. So let's look at those. Does this invite us to test a prophecy? 1 John 4, 1. Beloved ones, do not believe every inspired statement but test the inspired statements to see whether they originate with God. For many false prophets have gone out into the world. So not only do Watchtower in the life book say test, but the Bible also says test, see if it's true. The second one they cited was bizarre. This is what Jehovah says, the Holy One of Israel, the one who formed him. Would you question me about the things coming and command me about my sons and the works of my hands? If you look at Isaiah 45, this is a rhetorical question. This is not Jehovah, as I read it, saying, oh, test me on these things. <laughs> it's like it's like in Job when he's saying, where were you when I formed the earth, etc. So I don't think that's a particularly good scripture for them to use there. But the point is, they're saying test it, and I agree we should test these things. OK, further down in the same on the same page, I think it is. The Bible itself establishes the rules for testing a prophecy at Deuteronomy 18, 20 to 22 again and 13, 1 to 3. It must be spoken in Jehovah's name and at his command. It must come to pass. It must be in harmony with God's commandments and thus promote right worship. So Deuteronomy 18, 20 to 22. If as Jehovah's Witness you learn any verses, these three should be somewhere in your top 10 um a folder of things you memorize if any prophet presumptuously speaks a word in my name that i did not command him to speak or speaks in the name of other gods that prophet must die now here we're talking about watchtower the organization being a prophet i'm not suggesting anyone anywhere gets killed but if the organization dies because they're a false prophet well that's fine however you may say in your heart how will we know that jehovah has not spoken the word that is a good point. Let's read on. When the prophet speaks in the name of Jehovah and the word is not fulfilled or does not come true, then Jehovah did not speak that word. The prophet spoke it presumptuously. You should not fear him. Now, what it doesn't say is if some of the things they say doesn't come true or uh, as long as they get 20% right, you're OK. If anything a prophet says doesn't come true, then they're not of God. Now, you may not realize this, but the main point of a prophet prophesying the future is they'd prophesy a near side event that would happen. And a, that then gives uh, credibility to the far prophets they 
the pro far prophecies they do because the near ones happened. But also, if a prophet can say this thing's going to happen and it's very unlikely and then it does happen, that shows they're from God. Therefore, what they say, apart from the prophecy, you can trust is from God. That was the point of the prophets, one of the points of the prophets in the Old Testament. They'd say something, it happens. Therefore, you can know that when I say thus says the Lord, it's true. So anyone in the Old Testament saying thus says the Lord, they would have had to be able to show a prophecy, something that happened. Okay. So number one, here's some questions. Do the Watchtower claim to be a prophet? Number two, do they speak in the name of Jehovah? Or do they claim to speak in the name of Jehovah? Number three, did their word come true? So these three tests are based on Deuteronomy. So first, do they claim to be a prophet? Now remember, they said Jehovah's Witnesses do not claim to be inspired prophets. I'm saying one, we're talking Watchtower, not Jehovah's Witnesses. And two, ignore the word inspired that was just silly putting that in there. So let's have a look. Prophet. This is from Insight in the Scriptures, which we've already done. That's the Green Book. What is a prophet by their definition? One through whom divine will and purpose are made known. Although the etymology of the Hebrew term for a prophet is uncertain, the use of this distinctive term shows that true prophets were no ordinary announcers, but were spokesmen for God. OK, so they were spokesmen for God. I wonder if Jehovah's Witnesses or if the Watchtower have ever claimed to be spokesmen for God. This is the October 2017 Christian Life and Ministry. This is from their website. And the midweek meeting, October 30th, November the 5th, anointed Christians, they'd say that's the 144,000, serve as spokesmen for Jehovah. So the governing body are part of these anointed Christians. So the governing body are spokesmen for Jehovah and that was one of the criteria according to their own criteria, right, their own test. Now if I bring this in a bit bigger because we're getting small now. This is from the Watchtower Bound Volume 1972, page 197. And if you look at this paragraph here, a third way of coming to know Jehovah is through his representatives. In ancient times, he sent prophets as his special messengers. While these men foretold things to come, they also served the people by telling them of God's will for them at that time, often also warning them of dangers and calamities. People today can view the creative works, so people can see creation, that's saying. They have at hand the Bible, but it is little read or understood. I think that's true of Jehovah's Witnesses. They don't look at the Bible much. They think they do, but they don't. They look at Watchtower material sprinkled with Bible verses, and therefore they don't understand it. So does Jehovah have a prophet to help them to warn of dangers and declare things to come? Well, that's good. So in 1972, the question's asked, does Jehovah have a prophet? Identifying the prophet, very next paragraph. These questions can be answered in the affirmative. Who is this prophet? And yeah, then Watchtower do what they do, which is putting a load of things it's not. The clergy of so-called Christian nations hold themselves before the people as being the ones commissioned to speak for God. But as pointed out in the previous issue of this magazine, they have failed God and failed as proclaimers of his kingdom by approving a man-made political organisation, the League of Nations, now the United Nations, as the political expression of the kingdom of God on earth. However, Jehovah did not let the people of Christendom, as led by the clergy, go without being warned that the League was a counterfeit substitute for the real kingdom of God. He had a prophet to warn them. This prophet was not one man, but was a body of men and women. It was the small group of footstep followers of Jesus Christ, known at that time as International Bible Students. Today, they are known as Jehovah's Christian Witnesses. They are still proclaiming and it goes on about a Christian message, blah, blah, blah. So they absolutely said that they're a prophet by their own. That's just what they're saying there. Absolutely, they're a prophet. Let's look at the next one. This is from, where is this from? Awake, bound volume 1986. All true Christians are prophets. Oh, you can't, there you go. All true Christians are prophets. If I zoom in on that. The New American Bible correctly states prophet means one who speaks for another, especially for God. It does not necessarily mean that he predicts the future. Now I'm 
actually would agree with that. That would seem to be in line with the Bible. Obviously, a way to tell a false prophet is they lie about future events and they get it wrong. But a prophet is somebody who speaks, and that is perhaps why they claim to be prophets, because they claim to speak for Jehovah. How do you know if they speak for Jehovah? You look at their predictions and see if they come true. That was from Awake Bound, volume 1986. In the same uh, article, you will be interested to learn that God has on earth a people, all of whom are prophets or witnesses for God. In fact, they are known throughout the world as Jehovah's Witnesses. So all of Jehovah's Witnesses, according to this article, are prophets. This is from Watchtower Bound, volume 1972. Yes, the time must short the time must come shortly that the nations will have to know that really a prophet of Jehovah was among them. Actually now more than a million and a half persons are helping that collective or composite prophet in his preaching work, and well over that number of other people are studying the Bible with the prophet group and its companions. Now this was written in nineteen seventy two, shortly before the nineteen seventy five prediction. Some of you may know the Watchtower predicted the end, Armageddon would be 1975. They deny it, but if you find a Jehovah's Witness who was a Jehovah's Witness before 1975 and ask what they remember, they they will say, no, 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 it was taught. So the Kingdom Hall I went to, I spoke to a couple of people there in their 70s, one was in their 70s, one in their 80s, asked if they remember the 1975 thing. Oh, yeah, yeah, I remember it. Was it like, oh, some people think this, or was it taught? Oh, no, no, it was taught. Absolutely, it was taught. They were absolutely taught. 1975 is the end. This was written in 72, and it is right near the end, and that's why they're trying to get people excited, I'd suggest. So, do the Watchtower claim to be a prophet? I would absolutely say, yes, they do. According to their literature, the Watchtower claim to be a prophet. Do they speak in the name of Jehovah? What have they said about this? I'm going to zoom in again. This is from the Awake magazine, the Awake, sorry, bound volume, but this is from the website because I don't have the original, from March the 22nd, 1993. Jehovah's Witnesses in their eagerness for Jesus' second coming have suggested dates that turned out to be incorrect. That's true, they got lots of things wrong. Because of this, some have called them false prophets, do you write? Never in these instances, however, did they presume to originate predictions in the name of Jehovah. Okay, so they're saying they never said that we're talking in Jehovah's name. Never did they say, these are the words of Jehovah. Never did they say that, okay? The Watchtower, the official journal of Jehovah's Witnesses, has said, we have not the gift of prophecy, that's true, nor would we have our writings reverence as regarded as infallible. The Watchtower has also said that the fact that some Jehovah's Spirit, oh, the Watchtower have also said that the fact that some have Jehovah's Spirit does not mean now those serving as Jehovah's Witnesses are inspired. I agree they're not. It does not mean that the writings in this magazine, the Watchtower, are inspired and infallible and without mistake. That's true. They're not inspired. They are fallible and they have mistakes. The Watchtower does not claim to be inspired in its utterances, nor is it dogmatic. OK, we'll find out about that. The brothers preparing these publications are not infallible. Their writings are not inspired, as are those of Paul and other Bible writers. And so at times it has been necessary, as understanding becomes clearer, to correct views. And then they talk about Proverbs 4.18. If you read Proverbs 4.18 and read the whole of Proverbs 4, it's got nothing to do about changing doctrine and all things become clearer. That is not what it's about. It is one of the key verses they use to justify changing their mind on things. They call it a clarification. It's not a clarification. It's a change because they were wrong. And here they use uh, to correct views. Correction means because it was wrong. They do get things wrong. Their doctrines are wrong. People live and die by what they say. Okay, this is the Watchtower again from their website, 1992. We will also increase our joy if we prayfully and diligently study God's Spirit-inspired Word, that's the Bible, and Christian publications prepared under the Spirit's guidance. So they're claiming their publications are prepared under the Spirit's guidance. The Spirit of God is guiding their preparation. You can read it a few ways. However you read it, they're claiming... Actually, it's the spirits guiding them on this one. Watchtower Bound, Volume 1985. 
and if you look at this paragraph here, this is about baptism. They changed this, I think it was last year, but this was the second question when you're getting baptized. Do you understand that your dedication and baptism identify you as one of Jehovah's Witnesses in association with God's spirit directed organization? So anyone baptized, certainly from 85 up to probably 2018, when they got baptized, they had to say that they identify as one of Jehovah's Witnesses in association with God's spirit directed organization. They've recently dropped the spirit directed part because they've made so many changes and they had to keep saying oh, we're not inspired. It doesn't make sense to say they're spirit directed, but they have claimed they're spirit directed. And you can't say we're spirit directed and directed by Jehovah and then say, oh, no, we're not speaking Jehovah's name. Watch Tower Bound, volume 1956. This paragraph up here on page 666. Who controls the organization? Who directs it? Who is at the head? A man? A group of men? A clergy class? A pope? A hierarchy? A council? No, none of these. How is that possible? In any organization, is it not necessary that there be a directing head or policy making part that controls or guides the organization? Yes. Is the living God Jehovah the director of the theocratic Christian organization? Yes. So they are crediting Jehovah God with directing it, directing the organization. If the organization is doing their own thing, and you'd have to say they are because they keep getting things wrong and correcting things, then logically Jehovah is not the director. If Jehovah is directing the organization, then they would not make any mistakes. That's my viewpoint, but I think if you ever read the Bible, that makes absolute sense. Okay, Vindication, here it is. Uh, there's the actual book. Um, it's got, I've these colors are different because they were taken under different light. That was without a light. I shone a light on some of these old books so you can see the nice embossed image. I don't know if you can see that, but it's a king riding a horse, presumably King Jesus riding a horse there. So Vindication written in 1931. And this is from page 45. This, and I'm not going to zoom in on this because it's important, actually. The servant is not to tell his own message. Jehovah has made his faithful servant the watchman. And only as the Lord God directs the servant to speak, he does speak, having always a thus saith the Lord for every part of the message that is delivered. Only as the Lord directs, having always a thus saith the Lord. So what they wrote, what Rutherford wrote in 1931 was he only speaks and only writes, because it's what he's speaking is what he's writing, as the Lord directs. Everything they write is always thus said the Lord. Rutherford, everything he wrote, and this hasn't been retracted, said, thus said the Lord in 1925, this is going to happen. Thus said the Lord, early 1940s, this is happening. Thus said the Lord, he is absolutely speaking in the name of the Lord. There is no doubt that he's making that claim. The nation shall know that I am Jehovah. This is more of a recent book. Chapter 4 is called Commission to Speak in the Divine Name. It's what they're, <laughs> they're saying they speak in the divine name. They're saying they speak in the name of Jehovah. They're definitely ticking that box big time here. So this is from 1971, page 58 to 59 I'll be showing you here. So, so it is with the modern day counterpart of Ezekiel. It is not one person's body, but a composite body made up of many members. All these members were together to do the will of Jehovah, who is the creator of this modern Ezekiel. Who then are the group of persons who, toward the beginning of this time of the end, were commissioned to serve as the mouthpiece and active agent of Jehovah? In order to determine this, check the history of 1919, the first post-war year after World War, the First World War. So they are saying, and we'll look at the next part, they were commissioned to be the mouthpiece, which is the spokesman for Jehovah. They're saying check the history. When they say that, they mean check the history they've written since 1919, about 1919. If you check what was written before 1919, you wouldn't reach any of these conclusions because 
they're not truthful about their past. Let's put it that way. They're not truthful about what they wrote. Okay, the same book, page 61. I'll zoom out a bit in case you're interested in watching this. By the way, this video might be good to listen to while you're doing something else, like playing Minecraft or washing up or whatever, driving perhaps. Because I'm saying all the words, you don't actually have to see the screen. Certainly then, oh, certainly then, back there in the post-war year of 1919, there were none among the war guilty religious elements of Jewry and Christendom who qualified to be commissioned as the modern day counterpart or antitype of Ezekiel. Was there no one then whom Jehovah could raise up to serve in a way that corresponded to that of the ancient exile in Babylon? Whom could the real chariot of Jehovah's organization, organization roll up to and confront that he might bestow upon him this qualified one, the commission to speak as a prophet in the name of Jehovah? There we have it, commissioned to speak as a prophet in the name of Jehovah. And of course they're talking about themselves. Watchtower bound volume. 1972, what is required of God's messenger? Therefore, when it came time for the name of Jehovah and his purposes to be declared to the people, along with God's warning that Christendom is in her time of the end, who qualified that commission? Who was willing to undertake this monumental task as Jehovah's servant? Was there anyone to whom Jehovah's heavenly chariot could roll up and whom it could confront? They regurgitate a lot of their material. When you read enough of Watchtower's material, you'll see they just keep copying and pasting, change a word here and there. Anyway, carry on. More accurately, was there any group on whom Jehovah would be willing to bestow the commission to speak as a prophet in his name, as was done towards Ezekiel back there in 613 BCE? Speak as a prophet in his name. Yes, and of course they're talking about themselves. Now I just want to, something that's sort of a parallel but slightly different, but I thought it was worth bringing up. Matthew 12, 31 to 32. So Jesus has just been casting out some demons and the Pharisees has been accusing him of using Beelzebub to cast out the demons. And of course Jesus wasn't using Beelzebub, so they're attributing to the Holy Spirit Something the Holy Spirit did, they're saying, oh no, the devil did that. So Jesus says, For this reason I say to you, every sort of sin and blasphemy will be forgiven men, but the blasphemy against the Spirit will not be forgiven. For example, whoever speaks a word against the Son of Man, it will be forgiven him. But whoever speaks against the Holy Spirit, it will not be forgiven him. No, not in this system of things, nor in that to come. So this is talking about something done with the Holy Spirit, God was doing this and being attributed to the devil. I'm just showing this because it's interesting. I think what the Watchtower are doing is the other way around. They're doing something that isn't from God, but they absolutely attribute it to God. Okay, this is from the Watchtower Bound, volume 1973, page 402. Consider to the fact, fact, what they use the word fact a lot. So if you're a Jehovah's Witness, you believe this, you have to. You can't go against what you're taught because they represent God. Consider to the fact that Jehovah's organization alone in all the earth is directed by God's Holy Spirit or active force. Only this organization functions for Jehovah's purposes and to his praise. To it alone, God's sacred word, the Bible, is not a sealed book. It is directed by God's Holy Spirit. That is their claim. So do they speak in the name of Jehovah? I'm satisfied from things I've looked at in their own material that they claim they do speak in the name of Jehovah. Did their word come true? Well, let's look at what they said about this. This is from Reasoning in the Scriptures. We looked at this earlier. They have made mistakes. We know full well their word didn't come true. I'll look at this a bit more later on in this video. So I'm skipping over a bit for now. Did their word come true? No, they made lots of predictions. 19... 1914 they predicted beforehand that it would be the end and it wasn't. After 1914 in the 30s they lied about what they predicted about 1914. They predicted 1925 that um, the fathers would come back and live physically on earth. That didn't happen. 1941-42 would be Armageddon. That didn't happen. 1975 Armageddon. That didn't happen. 2000 didn't happen. Uh, before the generation 1914 died that didn't happen. There's lots of things they said. Yes, they make mistakes, but they admit they make mistakes. So I don't need to go further with that one. 
and I'm going to take a quick drink here. We've looked at Deuteronomy 18, 20 to 22. Now what about the other one, 13, 1 to 3? There's 18, 22, 13, 1 to 3. In case a prophet or one who foretells by dreams arises in your midst and gives you a sign or a portent, and the sign of that portent about which he spoke to you comes true, okay, that's interesting, while he is saying, let us walk after other gods, gods that you have not known, and let us serve them, you must not listen to the words of that prophet or that dreamer. For Jehovah your God is testing you to know whether you love Jehovah your God with all your heart and all your soul. So on the off chance that someone who claims to be a prophet, claims they're speaking for God, make a future prediction, and it comes true, there's another test you have to apply, and that is, are they going after other gods? So let's look at the three points in this Deuteronomy. Foretells by dreams. Sign comes true, let us walk other, other, other gods. Do they foretell by dreams? Let's see if the Watchtower foretell by dreams or not. I'll be, if any of you think you've got any information saying they've foretold things by dreams, I'd love to see that in the comments. I'm going to show you how they do foretell things, but I don't think it's by dreams. Has the sign come true? Then going to look at all the things they said that have come true. We should add balance to this. Do they walk after other gods? So first, do they foretell by dreams? Let's see how they know information. Light book. This is book two. Here we go, book two. And on the front, I think we've got a nice embossed mountain here, sun coming over. There's, oh no, must oh that must be a heavenly, uh, the new earth coming down because there's lightning here and there's already another earth down here. Light Book 2 was written in 1930. And on page 20, it says, uh, there's proof that those of the servant class on earth are directed by the Lord through his duly constituted deputies or angels. It is the angels that are directing them, not dreams. Preparation. Now this is a very worn out cover and so you can hardly see here what's going on. I'll zoom in a little bit for those interested. There appears to be a skeleton here and a load of chariots going on top. So this is presumably Armageddon and um, God coming down, Jesus coming down, people dying. This was written in 1933. What was Rutherford saying in 33? Certain duties and kingdom interests have been committed by the Lord to his angels, which include the transmission of information to God's anointed people, the anointed being 144,000 in these days, on the earth for their aid and comfort. So this is to his angels and it's transmitted. They transmit the information to the anointed. And I think, yep, the next page to carry on. Even though we cannot understand how the angels transmit this information, we know that they do it. And the scriptures and the facts show that it is done. So we're being told that the angels do it. We don't know how, but the facts show it. And the scriptures they cite here, Matthew 25, that's about the sheep and the goats. That is a future event when Jesus is physically on earth and there's a judgment happening there. So that doesn't show, that absolutely doesn't show that nowadays angels are transmitting information to an organization claiming they're speaking from Jehovah. Don't know how they do it. It says, of course, or it says we know how they do it, but we don't know how they do it. But it's, um, that's the facts. So not dreams. Angels are doing all the work. Preparation. Same book. Page 64. Enlightenment proceeds from Jehovah. I'll zoom in in case you need to see it. Enlightenment proceeds from Jehovah by and through Christ Jesus and is given to the faithful anointed on earth at the temple and brings great peace and consolation to them. Again, Zechariah talked with the angel of the Lord, which shows that the remnant are instructed by the angels of the Lord. The remnant do not hear audible sounds, because such is not necessary. Jehovah has provided his own good way to convey thoughts to the minds of his anointed ones. To all on the outside of the organisation of Jehovah his, is a secret organisation. So, um shows that the remnant are instructed by the angels of the Lord. The remnant do not hear audible sound. So the angels aren't appearing, but they convey thoughts to the minds. I don't know if you want to think of this as some sort of channeling experience that goes on, but they get their ideas somehow planted in their mind from these angels that they can't actually hear. 
The last sentence of this is very interesting. It says, to all on the outside of the organization of Jehovah, his is a secret organization. Now, if any of you ever want to look into secret organizations on the outside or secret, you have to be a member to find out. You join the organization and you have to work your way up the organization. And as you get higher and higher, you know more light, you know more truth. That is absolutely contrary to what's taught in the Bible. The Bible is an open book. The Bible can be understood by anyone. There are not secrets in the Bible you have to know and understand. But they're saying oh, if you're outside the organization, uh, that's, it's a secret organization. Uh, that's not a healthy way to be. Riches. My grubby old riches book here. Here we have the embossed pictures of mountains, sunshine behind it. We have fields here. We have wheat. Oh, zoom in, sorry. We have fields, we have wheat, and we have some grapes here that have been gathered. And riches is from 1936. Jehovah has made the necessary arrangement with, in his organization to instruct his people and all recognize that for some years the watchtower has been the means of communicating information to God's people. That does not mean that those who prepare the manuscripts for the watchtower are inspired. Here it is again, they're not inspired. But rather it means that the Lord through his angels sees to it that the information is given to his people in due time and that he brings to pass the events and fulfillment of his prophecy and then invites those devoted to him to see the same. So it is through his angels. They're not inspired. They're saying the people doing the writing, they don't know. They're told by angels what to write, but not audibly. It's planted in their mind. If God used angels to tell somebody something, it would be right. There would not be any mistakes. There is nothing, nowhere in the Bible can you get that an angel was commissioned with passing a message on and somehow there were some Chinese whispers and it was misunderstood. Also, when angels do convey messages in the Bible, they tend to appear. There are many instances you could probably think of where an angel appeared to somebody and the angel of the Lord actually appeared. Or well, there was Gabriel, of course, and various other places. So, in my mind, they're making stuff up here. It's a bit... Anyway... Okay, where is this? The light book. Here is the light book. Light book number one. It's the same cover as number two. From 1930. Again, the Lord sent his angel to carry out matters of great importance as pertaining to his people on earth. He calls his representatives or deputies who are invisible to men, to the angels, to direct what should be done by his visible servants on the earth. This is further proof of the completeness with which Jehovah keeps in his hand all his work. So he sent his angels. His angels are the ones giving the information to the people in the watchtower who are writing these books and make lots of mistakes and keep changing their mind. Why are the angels not getting sacked? I mean, why would God use an angel that's getting the message wrong? And yet it is angels. So for there any Jehovah's Witnesses that watch this or ex-Jehovah's Witnesses that are watching this, when you read your watchtowers and you're doing the study, you don't need to worry that it's just things written by men because it's not. They're told what to write by the angels. So hopefully that gives you some comfort. But then you should be worried why are these angels getting so much wrong. OK, light book two. Um, doubtless, no need to doubt this, it's true. Doubtless the Lord uses these holy angels to direct the course of his people on earth. What course they shall take and what they shall do. The angels are part of God's organization. So the teaching of the watchtower is there's an earthly or part of God's organization and a heavenly one. And these angels are somehow obviously a bridge between the two. Watchtower bound volume 1972. I'll zoom in again just in case it's a bit small. This would indicate that Jehovah's Witnesses today make the declaration of the good news of the kingdom under angelic direction and support. There we go. It's the angels. Angels. Angels everywhere. Now, you may be thinking, OK, um, there's no biblical parallel to this where angels are unseen and pass along a message and Chinese whispers corrupt it. But I'm still going to believe the watchtower. Even though the angels are getting it wrong or the watchtower 
getting it implanted in their minds wrong at least they're speaking they're getting things from the holy angels of god so there's no need to worry there the finished mystery this this is possibly if not my favorite book one of my favorite books this is the last book that was written before jesus apparently chose the organization so you can be sure that jesus read this book and knew what was in it and was like oh this is good stuff i'm going to choose these people finished mystery where am i going to go with this i wonder i'm going to have to zoom in here here we go so this is revelation 8 what they've done in the finished mystery i'm going to zoom out again in the finished mystery they go through revelation and ezekiel and i think there may be another book and they go through it verse by verse, take the verses apart and explain what the verses mean. And this is talking about Revelation 8. So Revelation 8, 3, and another angel came and stood at the altar and it goes on like that. And another angel. What other angels is in Revelation 8, 3? Not the voice of the Lord mentioned in the preceding chapter, but the corporate body, the Watchtower Bible and Tract Society, which Pastor Russell formed to finish his work. This verse, Revelation 8.3, this verse shows that though Pastor Russell has passed beyond the veil, he died the year before, he is still managing every feature of the harvest work. The Watchtower Bible and Tract Society is the greatest corporation in the world because from this time of its organisation until now, the Lord has used it as his channel through which to make known the glad tidings. Yep, <laughs> you heard that right shouldn't laugh sorry it's serious pastor russell the dead pastor russell although he's passed beyond the veil he is still managing every feature of the harvest work the harvest work is preaching the it should be preaching the good news of the kingdom and jehovah's witnesses may not realize that but it's actually being directed by pastor russell and these angels are coming down and implanting into the mind of the people at the watchtower what to write I'm thinking necromancy here, but I maybe shouldn't say that. Also thinking automatic writing, but if you don't know what necromancy is or automatic writing, you might want to look those up. So that was from page 144. Okay, so do they foretell by dreams? We were looking at Deuteronomy remember, earlier. No, there's nothing that I've seen in the Watchtower writing to suggest that they foretell by dreams. The reason they tell things, it's all from Jehovah. And it's the angels that are implanting the messages in their mind. And as a general harvest work, that's all being directed by Charles Taze Russell. Has the sign come true? So now I want to look at all the signs that have come true. Uh, all this talking. As I mentioned earlier, I'm a spurger, so I can monologue and talk for ages. OK, well, now we've done that. Do they walk after other gods? <laughs> Okay, some of you think some signs have come true. Have some signs come true. Let's look at this then. I'll try and throw you a bone here. Let's see what's going on. This is from Vindication. That was one of the books we looked at earlier. 1931. No further delay. God's faithful people on the earth emphasised the importance of the dates 1914 and 1918 and 1925. They had much to say about these dates and what would come to pass, but all they predicted did not come to pass. The predictions as to the dates were correct, but what came to pass could not be fully seen in advance. Now, this is a stupid, stupid thing to write. They did talk about 1914. Everything they wrote about 1914 was wrong. What they, from 1930s, what the Watchtower say they wrote about 1914 isn't what they actually said. If you find that surprising, look at my first video, my letter to the Watchtower. There I go through and prove that what they claim about 1914 isn't true. 1918, I've not actually come across anything pre-1918 that talks about 1918. But once they passed 1918, they started saying things about 1918. 1925, that was when the fathers, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob and all the others, were going to come back and physically be on the earth. So yes, they had much to say about these dates and what would come to pass. But all they predicted did not come to pass. Now that's an ambiguous sentence if they think about it. Jehovah's Witnesses could have read this and thought, okay, well 90% of what they said didn't, 90% uh, did come to pass, but all they predicted didn't come to pass. 
the truth of the statement is all they predicted did not come to pass. Everything they predicted didn't come to pass. I've not yet come across anything where what they predicted, apart from obvious things like, oh, the sun's going to rise tomorrow, there's nothing outrageous or surprising they've predicted that's come to pass. And yet they harp on and on and on about all the marvellous things that were predicted in the past. Absolute lies. OK, here's another one. This is from their website from the Watchtower 1960, because I don't have this one, page 444. I'm going to zoom in for you because I'm lovely like that. Has the faithful and discreet slave proved to be ahead of its times? Yes, the faithful and discreet slave was awake to the coming of 1914. No, it wasn't. In 1942, the faithful and discreet slave, guided by Jehovah's unerring spirit, made known that the democracies would win World War II and there would be a United Nations organisation set up. Such wakefulness was concerning events that unerring took place three years later. Oh, such wakefulness was concerning events that unerringly took place three years later. OK, is there some truth in this? In 1942, did they write, democracies would win World War II and there'd be a United Nations organisation set up? They give the reference. I don't have that particular pamphlet. I can accept they wrote that. And then it happened three years later, they're saying, OK, what happened three years later? The war ended. So let's start with that. The war ended in 1945. In 1942, they're saying Jehovah told them the democracies were going to win. Well, that's silly. <laughs> By 1942, all the Allies were expecting to win. In 1941, at the end of 1941, Japan attacked Pearl Harbor and brought America into the war. America had masses of troops and armament. In 1941, Operation Barbarossa, I think it was, Hitler attacked Russia. The majority of Hitler's forces were on the Eastern Front. And Russia had an un appeared to have an unending amount of supplies of troops and tanks. So by 1941, the German generals considered the war lost. All the Allies could see that the war was lost. There was still a lot of work to be done, but Hitler's eventual demise and the Nazis losing the Axis powers was inevitable. So in 1942, after all this had happened on the world stage, to say the democracies, democracies would win, the Allies are going to win, anyone could say that because everyone believed it because it was going to happen. What about the other thing? They said there'd be United Nations organisations set up. OK, let's look at the United Nations here. This is, I've gone to the United Nations website here. This is the history of the United Nations. And if we zoom in on that past, 1st of January, the name United Nations coined by United States President Franklin D. Roosevelt was first used in the Declaration by United Nations 1st of January 1942, during the Second World War, when the representatives pledged their governments to the uh, continued fighting. So the prediction to say that they predicted these things in 1942, it had already happened. <laughs> the, the United Nations had already, already been agreed, the name was already used, there was no prediction there, the end of the war, that was already known. There's nothing special about that. So has a sign come true? No, they've not predicted anything. There's, if you think they have something substantial, not something that everyone thought anyway, please tell me in the comments and I'll look it up. But I have not come across anything. Do they walk after other gods? Now, I don't suppose anyone out there is going to suggest that the Watchtower, the organisation, do anything to promote walking after other gods. So I want to look at John chapter 14, verse 6. Jesus said to him, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. No one comes to the Father except through me. So if you read the Watchtower material that they call the Bible study, which is that silly little book I've got on the bookshelf somewhere, or if you go to the meetings, they make such a big thing about to know someone you have to know their personal name. God's name is Jehovah. You have to know the name Jehovah. There's a few things wrong with that. 
I'm awful with names. <laughs> I can be quite close to someone and not know their name because I'm maybe because I'm Aspie. But in the own Watchtower literature on the website and also in hard copy, they they admit that the name Jehovah was made up by the monk several hundred years ago. A Spanish Catholic monk coined the name Jehovah. They also admit that the name Yahweh would be more accurate than Jehovah. They also, of course, acknowledge that Hebrew doesn't have a just sound, so it's not Jehovah. They also have on their website, I might show this one day, they show that um, it was a blunder, the name Jehovah. So all this emphasis is put on knowing the name Jehovah. If you want to know God, you have to know his personal name. And at the same time, they're saying, uh, actually, it's not the name. But anyway, in the Bible, it says no one comes to the Father except through me. If you want to know the Father, the focus has got to be on Jesus. You have to go through Jesus. Now, the Watchtower do talk about Jesus, but if you look at what they say and what the Bible actually says, it doesn't actually marry up very well. So for myself, given that Jesus said the only way to the Father is through him, and they do not go through Jesus to the Father, I think an argument could be made that they go through other gods. But that's just me, and if you don't see that way, that's absolutely fine. So to wrap this up, and we're still not quite at the end, to wrap this up, reasoning from the scriptures, the book we looked at to start with. True prophets and the false can be recognized. I'll zoom in for you. True prophets and the false can be recognized by the fruitage manifest in their lives and the lives of those who follow them. Matthew 7, 15 to 20, they quote from here. Be on the watch for the false prophets that come to you in sheep's covering, but inside they are ravenous wolves. By their fruits you will recognize them. Every good tree produces fine fruit, but every rotten tree produces worthless fruit. Really then, by their fruits you will recognize those men. Every rotten tree produces worthless fruit. I want to look at that. So when I showed the elder my letter and the things about 1914, and he came and said, OK, the Watchtower are lying about 1914, but consider their fruits. That is their go-to line. If you show evidence about things that society have done wrong or are doing wrong, it's, ah, but consider their fruits. Fine. Let's consider some of their fruits. Face the facts. Here's a booklet from 1938. Facts. They like to use the word facts. So let's look at some facts here, shall we? Facts fully stated are never open to successful contradiction and therefore they stand admitted. So they're saying in a court of law, it's a fact. So we just go with it. The body that assembles the fact should do so honestly, without prejudice or partiality and free from fear of any creature. When assembled, the fact should be presented to the people uncensored. So this is a this book is about facing the facts. So let's look at some facts. That was on page three, page 50. The Jonadabs, they got this thing about antitypes. They're talking about Jehovah's Witnesses here, who now contemplate marriage, it would seem, would do better if they wait a few years until the fiery storm of Armageddon is gone and to then enter the marital relationship and enjoy the blessings of participating in filling the earth with righteous and perfect children. So in 1938, in the brochure, face the facts, because this is facts, and we know that everything they say is, thus says the Lord. They speak for Jehovah. They know that it's true because it's coming from angels directed by the dead Charles Tate Russell. They were telling Jehovah's Witnesses, probably young, got a sweetheart. They want to get married. Don't get married. Wait till after Armageddon, because they were teaching Armageddon 41, 42. That's when the end's coming. This was written in 38. You've only got to wait three years and then get married. OK, this is now the Awake magazine, 1969. This is uh, from my bound volume. If you are a young person, I'll zoom in here. If you are a young person, you also need to face the fact that, as again, it's a fact, that you will never grow old in this present system of things. So all those people now in their 60s or 70s, it's actually a fact you'll never grow old, so you're not old yet. Why not? Because all the evidence and fulfillment of Bible prophecy indicates that this corrupt system is due to end in a few years. This is written in 69, and that's because it's going to end at 75. Of the generation that observed the beginning of the last days in 1914, Jesus foretold, this generation will by no means pass away until all these things occur. 
That's not strictly true. Jesus didn't say of the generation in 1914, this generation would by no means pass away. Jesus didn't allude to 1914 at all. He didn't mention 1914. The way they reached 1914 from the Bible doesn't stand up. 1914 isn't from the Bible. Jesus was never referring to the generation of 1914 because it's made up. Jesus did say this generation will by no means pass away until all these things occur but he was not referring to the generation of 1914. Right, let's carry on. Same article. Therefore, as a young person, you will never fulfill any career that the system offers. If you are in high school and thinking about a college education, it means at least four, perhaps even six or eight more years to graduate into a specialised career. But where will this system of things be by that time? It will be well on the way towards its finish, if not actually gone. So in four years time, 73, it'd be well on the way to be finished. But in six, eight years time, it will be gone. That's what they're saying here with those words. This is why parents who, there's my thumb, look at that. No, it's not, it's one of my fingers. Anyway, this is why parents who base their lives on God's prophetic word find it much more practical to, to direct their young ones into trades that do not require such long periods of additional schooling. And trades such as carpentry, plumbing and others will be useful not only now, but perhaps even more so in the reconstruction work that will take place in God's new order. With such practical trades, many young persons have been able to sustain themselves with part-time work. This allows them to spend much more of their time helping interested persons to learn God's requirements for life by studying the Bible with them. As I've mentioned in other videos in this video, they do not study the Bible. They go door to door and they read a little booklet, whatever book that they had at the time, about the teachings of the Watchtower and they sprinkle in verses. So young people in the late 60s were being told, don't bother with school because you will not, if it's a long education, you're not going to graduate. And if it's a short one, well, you're not going to get to do a career because it's all going to end soon. Why don't you learn practical skills like practical skills like carpentry and plumbing and stuff? Oh, by the way, we need to build kingdom halls. Anyone a plumber? Can anyone do carpentry? Oh, that's good. Well, you you can do you can work for Jehovah by building these buildings for us. And by the way, it's financed by the local Jehovah's Witnesses as well. If you can't finance it, then the headquarters would give you a loan, which you could pay back with interest. And they got in trouble for that because they're not actually a bank, so they had to do interest free. So there's lots of kingdom halls, this is an aside now, lots of kingdom halls were built by Jehovah's Witnesses and financed by Jehovah's Witnesses. And then recently they started to get signed over to the headquarters because it makes a lot more sense for the headquarters to hold all the buildings. And so by holding all these buildings that were be built and financed by the Jehovah's Witnesses, you don't need to worry about them. And then they started selling off the buildings and getting the money. Anyway, that's an aside. Loads of videos online you can find about that. If you want to research it, you'll find it. If you want to ignore all that, I just said that's fine because it is off topic and I do get off topic. Reasoning from the scriptures. We just looked at this. By every rotten tree, but every rotten tree produces worthless fruit. So the, tr the fruit from before 1914, farmers, because they knew the end was coming, who had witnesses or Bible students in those time, didn't bother planting their crops. There's no point planting their crops because it's all ending in 1914. Some of them sold their houses. 1914 Armageddon didn't happen. The majority of followers of Russell left the organisation. I'd say that's a pretty rotten fruit. 1925, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob and all the others didn't come back. Loads of people left the organisation. That's a rotten fruit. 41, 42, Armageddon didn't happen again. Lots of people left and people gave up, people went to prison supporting what the Watchtower said, and they know it's true because Charles Taze Russell was directing the overall harvest work, angels were passing the messages on. 41, 42 Armageddon didn't happen, people left, more worthless fruit, more lives wasted. People who have left this organisation have realised they've, some have lost decades of their life, they never got an education. This is all worthless fruit. 1975, again, Armageddon didn't happen, you can look at their numbers of um, baptised publishers. It goes down in 77 and 78 because of the 75 failure. Worthless fruit. So 
every rotten tree produces worthless fruit. Is the fruit of the organisation worthless? Yes, it's a rotten tree. It absolutely doesn't produce good fruit. So my conclusions from all this. The Watchtower claimed to be a prophet. From the material I've read, I'm 100% convinced that they claim to be a prophet. And tested by biblical standards and from their own standards, they are a false prophet. The Watchtower have claimed that their organisation is directed by a supernatural power, Jehovah, is directed by spirit beings they identify as angels, and the harvest work is directed by their dead founder, Charles Taze Russell. That is their claim. What I think of that is if the Watchtower is directed by anything supernatural, it cannot be the God of the Bible, nor can it be holy angels. Now, some Jehovah's Witnesses may not like the idea of angels implanting their messages, and others may accept they are planting them, but a holy angel is not going to get the message wrong. A load of hogwash there. Number five, the Watchtower are deceitful about their past. There is so much evidence to show that. They know that that they know not the way nor the truth. Their teachings do not lead to the Father. Jehovah's Witnesses are not in the truth. So for anyone who doesn't know, if you're a Jehovah's Witness, you're known to be in the truth. You meet another witness, the question is, oh, how long have you been in the truth? Oh, are your kids still in the truth? And by using this phrase, they somehow get used to the idea that they're in the truth. Jesus said, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. And that's from John 14, 6. So, in conclusion to this extremely long video, if you made it this far, thank you very much. As far as I can tell, I am satisfied that the Watchtower do claim to be a prophet and they're a false prophet because they get things wrong. Although they claim over and over again they're not inspired, they yet say that they are directed by God they're directed by God's spirit. They get their information from angels, but not audibly, it's planted within their minds. And the harvest work is directed by Charles Taze Russell. If you found any of this interesting or new, or you enjoyed it, a comment, a subscribe with the bell, a like, all these things would be good. Um, <laughs> I think I'll make the next video an easy one for me to prepare because this took me a long time. Thank you very much for listening. I, I hope you found it interesting.